So I'm very pleased to say I'm joined now by Marvin Rees, Mayor of Bristol. Marvin, very good to meet up with you. Uh, tell me, what are you doing here at COP26? Well, we're up here with a couple of key messages. One is that the battle on climate change will be won and lost in cities. Uh, but cities, mayors, need the steady, predictable finance uh, if they are actually going to play the role that we need them to play in decarbonising their urban areas. And you've been working with mayors from many other cities in, in building this message and trying to move forward how cities can play a role in tackling the climate and ecological emergency. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so people may not know actually cities increasingly are, are international operators there are over 300 city networks live in the world at the moment uh, and that's a recognition that in many ways the world has moved on it is no longer just a nation-state world cities are international they can operate in a post-national way international populations cultures they exist because things move and cross over right people move cross over you get a city trade moves crosses over you get you know a city uh, and they begin operating like that and we know that if we want to work for the good of people within our city boundaries we have to shape the national and international context in which we have to uh, to live and that's really uh, you know what drives us here today climate change is one of those you know drive you know uh, predictors of quality of life in bristol we have to influence what goes on uh, nationally international and uh, nationally in terms of decarbonisation and the recovery of nature and last year, uh, after working with Avon Wildlife Trust and many other partners, uh, you declared a climate and ecological emergency in Bristol. Uh, tell us why you did that and also, you know, how does it play out in, in your, the city that you're mayor of? Well, the credit really needs to go to Ian Barrett and Avon Wildlife Trust. We were doing lots of work on the climate strategy around after following the declaration of a climate emergency. Uh, but in one of our environment meetings, Ian brought the challenge and says, well, you can solve climate, you can decarbonise, but you're still losing nature. And that in and of itself will be an existential threat. Uh, and so we asked him to do some initial work, scope out what that ecological uh, challenge was for Bristol. We declared an ecological emergency. Uh, within seven, eight months of that declaration, we had an ecological strategy. And now we've got our ecological action plan, which is a whole raft of um, interventions um, in Bristol, uh, but built around uh, four key areas. 30% of Bristol being given over to nature, it's, it's recovery and it's thriving. Uh, the recovery of our waterways as, as nature corridors, uh, reduce of pesticides. We've got a 2030 target reduction of 50%, but we actually want to get to 100% before that but we've got to look at the finance all these challenges we have to come through but also recognizing the role Bristol as an urban area plays in the wider ecological systems of which it is about that are outside its uh, boundaries so it's really focused the city's mind. Yeah it sounds absolutely excellent now of course the, the challenges you have there is also people will be saying quite rightly they will be wanting new housing lots of other demands in here how do you see the need to how do, how do you see it will be possible to balance some of those different competing demands and in fact even in, integrate them? Well, it's going to be difficult. And, and it's one of the conversations we have with the city, with campaign groups as well, is that sometimes you've got two things that are true at the same time, but they're very difficult to hold together. Uh, our point is, let's all move upstream together and face the complexity of the challenge. Bristol will be similar to many cities. We have a fixed geographical area. It's not getting any bigger. Bristol is 42 square miles. Our population is 465,000. We anticipate being at 550,000 by the middle of this century. We have 15,000 people on our housing waiting list. Uh, we have over 1,000 families in temporary accommodation. We have a housing crisis, an unaffordability in housing crisis. We have one in four of our children growing up in poverty. So we've got great wealth and great poverty within the city. We have to meet that challenge. We have to, both morally, but also if we don't, it's going to be a problem anyway. Uh, but we have to meet that challenge in the context of dealing with the climate and ecological emergency. That makes it a wicked challenge. Uh, but it's one that we have to put our minds to and you have, to, you have to set out what you're trying to deliver and get as much of everything you want to deliver um, at the same time. We can't leave people behind. We can't destroy the planet in meeting those needs. We have to find that way. So what you're looking for is those kind of integrated solutions that tick those boxes of solving many of those problems in, in one go. Yeah, we, we, yeah, so clearly we've said to people we, we have to have a conversation around housing density. We have to bring forward brownfield sites. The challenge there is there can be often more complicated and more expensive to bring forward. So there's a financial consequence to that. And that if you're spending more there, you're spending less elsewhere, somewhere else. Uh, but we have to look at density. We have to look at height, things that perhaps people wouldn't have wanted to talk about before. 
and we have to you know, own the consequences of our position. If people are saying, well, we don't want you to build more densely and higher, then we have to say, what, are you advocating sprawl? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, own, own the consequences of, of what you're stop, you know, stopping happen, uh, happen. So, so what, we're, what I think what it pushes for is a really mature conversation in the city. That in and of itself is a challenge because the maturity of our political conversation has not been helped by the kind of social media world that we're in and the smash grab journalism that we're sometimes subjected to. It's going to be, it's going to be one in which we, we do nuance, we deal with complexity, we anticipate unintended consequences and try and mitigate those and where sometimes we do something knowing there's a price to be paid for it and then our job is to say well we have to do it we have to incur that cost but what can we do to mitigate that cost if we have to develop a piece of land that was good for nature because we have to do it mm -hmm. what, what, what do we do instead of that well how do we make up for that as best as we can so, uh, somewhere else or in some way within that that development but these are all challenges that modern cities are gonna have to take on and are there any particular sites in and around Bristol that you feel particularly excited about, present real opportunities for those kind of integrated solutions at the moment? Yeah, we've got a site up in um, Loch Lees in Bristol, actually, which has just won an award because of net gain in biodiversity during the development of that site. We have a housing development up in Hartcliffe that has actually had a nature corridor built into it as well, because it's about connecting the, 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 the sure. nature spots as well, isn't it? We're looking at a development on uh, in... Um, Western Harbour, which is at the end of the waterfront in Bristol. Mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity there is to, is to integrate that with flood defence and the uh, improvement of the waterfront area and nature in that area as well and build nature into that development, not just concrete it over. Again, some people who are opposing housing are saying you're just trying to plaster the area in houses. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to build good quality houses that, that support the recovery of nature you know, at the same time. But uh, I, I think the, the, the schemes in, um, oh, there's one other actually that was spoken about today, the Bocklock scheme, which is a Skanska IKEA partnership Bocklock. Um, they've uh, developed their building homes off-site manufacture to drastically reduce carbon mm -hmm. on Airport Road, where well, there's a stream that runs through that, where well, that stream become a dumping ground. But it's actually part of that development, that stream has been brought back to life. You know, there's, li there's life back in the this, in this stream. And in parts of Bristol, we've seen return of otters, and so, so, so we have had some success. I'm in no way taken away from the, the scale of challenge and the pressure, but there, there have been successes that shows you can do urbanisation well. And so you're here at COP26, the message you're giving is we can do this with the support, with the finance. Actually, cities can really help lead the world in tackling the climate nature emergency. Well, I think cities are absolutely essential at the moment. Cities, bad urbanisation is a massive problem. Mm -hmm. right? It would generate emissions, it would lead to inefficient living, probably political instability and all the rest of it. But good urbanisation offers a chance for people to live more efficiently. But it means that it has to be planned, it has to be financed, it has to be well designed, thought out. Uh, and now, as we approach a planet of 10 billion people, you know, good quality cities has to be one of the means by which we, we host that growing population because we've got to find a way of hosting them. They can't just sprawl, spread out. So I think, yeah, we've got to get that message through at COP that cities have to be at the forefront of the thinking and be seen as a tool that we invest in to help us manage a growing world population. And final question then, and in trying to do that, how important is it working with partners like the Wildlife Trust? Oh, massively. I mean, you've, I, I would say no, nobody has all the answers. I, don't, I clearly don't have all the answers. What you've got to do is find good people around who've got the answers, bring expertise and say, listen, just come and release your expertise. Come and release your challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, there are, challenge, there, are, there are times when a challenge will come and it causes us a, a, a real problem, right? But that's the challenge we need, isn't it, right? And we, we approach it in a relationship of graciousness and we, say, you know, and we bring the challenge and we bring the solution to that challenge as well. And as I said, owning the, consequen owning the consequences of that challenge. If we're saying don't do this, and I say there's a consequence to that, join me in dealing with that consequence, then, you know, then we've got that good constructive relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say that's really important. And I think for campaign groups, it's really important to take that into account. Mm -hmm. The scale and pace of change we need to deliver right, needs relationships it needs good quality cooperation and we got to make sure that wherever there's an ally we build that that alliance uh, i think sometimes it's slipped into i'm going to bash the state or i'm going to bash this political representative mm -hmm. there are some political representatives that need to be bashed <laughs> there are some states that need to be bashed but where you find a potential ally mm -hmm. come along and help them identify the solutions in a f wickedly complicated world mm -hmm. marvin reese mayor of bristol thank you very much for talking to the wildlife trusts